Okay, today is Thursday, August 30th, 2007. My name is Harriet Williamson. I am producer here at WILL AM Radio. World War II veteran Colonel John Lewis Frothingham is here in the WILL television studio of Campbell Hall on the University of Illinois campus in Urbana for the Veterans History Project at the Library of Congress. And for this interview, Henry Radcliffe is uh, Director of Sound, Lighting, and Camera. Thank you so much for being here today. Glad to be here, Harry. <laughs> right. Could you tell us about your background and your education? Certainly, be glad to. I was educated here. Let's start out. I was born in Boston, Massachusetts. I only have three words that are still Yankee words. <laughs> uh, cocky and, and aunt uh, and Kant are the three that I get uh, talked about <laughs> from time to time. We moved to Evanston, Illinois when I was about 10 or 11. Uh, I ended up graduating from Evanston Township High School in 1936 and came down to the university. My first interest in the military was probably hearing stories from my uncle who was a pilot observer in World War I and was shot down in France, but did survive. He and my uh, mother and I finally uh, could see the handwriting on the wall. I'd come and I was in ROTC here wasn't very fond of it at all. I think I was taking it because I had to take it. Mm -hmm. But I did sign up for my junior year and uh, got paid for a uniform and became even more disenchanted uh, with what was going to be the Army life. So I resigned and paid back the $75 that they'd given me for, for my uniform. But as I say, then we could see that something was going to happen and the war was already underway over in Europe and had been for some, some time. Uh, my uncle and my mom heard about the candidates class in Quantico, Virginia in the Marine Corps. And the candidates class was to be three months long. So we, or I should say they and I, signed up for it uh, in December 1940. And I was called to active duty February 1941 and started a candidates class for three months at the end of which in May, I was commissioned as a second lieutenant and then went on to uh, reserve officers uh, training uh, and graduated from that after three months. Uh, and again, school was looming, so I went into the artillery uh, branch of it. And I was in the artillery branch of it at the time we went to war because of uh, Pearl Harbor. Uh, stayed in Quantico for a while and then was transferred to the 1st Marine Division. 1st Marine Division was not fully formed at that time, so we're talking about uh, probably the early spring of uh, 1942. I was engaged at this particular time to Catherine, and uh, Catherine also graduated from here. She graduated in 41, I graduated in 40, and uh, so we did, uh, did get married in uh, March 1942. Uh, I was in New River, North Carolina at the time, which was really a camp out in tents, uh, but the area was quite good for, for field artillery training. Uh, that went on for uh, quite, quite some time. And then when we realized that the Japanese who had come down south from Japan a considerable distance including the Philippines and many of the islands, including Saipan and Tinian and Guam, which they took away, took away from us. And along about uh, July, I guess, early July 42, we found that the Japanese were building an airfield uh, on Guadalcanal, uh, which is in the British Solomon Islands, oh, I'd guess four to 700 miles from uh, the mainland of Australia. That, of course, threatened Australia uh, with possible invasion and so on. Now, the Japanese never did in actually invade it, but they did bomb Darwin and made some skirmishes along the northern uh, coast of Australia itself. Uh, we <clears throat> uh, mustered up, had a horrible rehearsal in the Fiji Islands. Everything went wrong so badly that uh, the third uh, wave of infantry, which is very early in an amphibious landing, uh, we called off the whole uh, rehearsal and just proceeded on to Guadalcanal. 
Now, the Japanese did not expect to see us until about uh, the early spring of 1943, nor had we earlier expected to have to make an offensive operation against them until about the same time. So it was really a surprise on, on, on both sides. Uh, we were very fortunate coming in early that morning, August 7th, 1942, that there was cloud cover, a little bit of rain, and off and on. The Japanese totally did not expect us. They were still eating their breakfast when all of a sudden there was enough daylight that they could see this tremendous naval force uh, parked outside the, the island itself. And we made the landing starting earlier on Tulagu uh, and uh, across the, uh, well, we called it the Narrows or the Slot or whatever it was, across the way about an hour earlier over there and 25 miles from them was the Red Beach where we landed uh, about 11,000 Marines. In other words, just a portion of the 1st Marine Division because that's all that had been uh, ready to go at that time. Our landing was relatively unopposed. Uh, the landing over in Tulagi, they did have to fight uh, all of about two days before they finally took it. My very best friend from back in uh, near Boston, Massachusetts, was killed over there. And our only casualty was one knucklehead that took his rifle and fired up into the coconut trees and knocked down a coconut, and the coconut hit a Marine on the head and severely injured him. That was the only actual casualty we had that first day. We proceeded on and after about uh, two weeks, uh, and we were lucky. Uh, oh, I should also state that the Navy, because of a battle that took place, I think it was on the night of August 8th, 1942, and the Japanese had done some excellent training in night fighting. Uh, we were very poor and had done little or no training in night fighting, and uh, they sunk uh, four heavy cruisers, the Vincennes, the Astoria, the Quincy, uh, and uh, sunk the uh, Australian uh, heavy cruisers, uh, Cannonbera, blew the bow off the Chicago, in other words, badly mauled us uh, right off Guadalcanal coast there. Of course, we didn't know any better. We were out there clapping our hands and cheering and everything else, thinking we are doing a tremendous job. Well, we were not. Well, that caused Admiral Fletcher to decide to uh, pull the uh, pull, of it, pull his forces out of there, all of our protecting forces, and that left Admiral Turner, with the, the, uh, who commanded the amphibious part of it, the choice of what to do, and he had to uh, call off a lot of the landing of our supplies, our food, our 155 howitzer guns, which was the biggest we had. We couldn't land them. We couldn't land the engineer equipment, the pioneer equipment, in order to continue the building of the airfield and a lot of other things that we wish we'd had. Uh, and so there we were. Uh, fortunately for us, the Japanese, as I say, didn't expect us. They had only had a fighting, fighting force of about 400 to 500 people, and uh, they had about 1,000 to 2,000 laborers. So they retreated. While they retreated so quickly, they left some of their breakfast on the tables there, and quite a lot of rice and fish heads. So we ate Japanese rice, which was excellent, by the way, uh, and that's about all. We were down to uh, one main meal a day and kind of a snack on what little we, uh, we had. And uh, the Navy did not show up again for a, a couple of weeks wow. uh, with any more food, uh, extra ammunition, and so on. Uh, as I say, the Japanese came over and bombed us. I think they brought sandwiches along from... Uh, uh, Rabal and and, uh, and and truck because they'd bomb us at about noontime just as we were trying to get our own noon meal what little we we had uh, going at that particular particular time uh, long finally they did show up with some additional food and some cigarettes for the for the troops uh, I didn't smoke I don't smoke I suppose I smoked a pack of cigarettes my entire life the second shipment of tobacco they brought in some cigars and chewing tobacco, and I was a little happier with that. Uh, and along about the same time, the first of our airplanes showed up, uh, which eventually became the Cactus Air Force. And the Cactus Air Force was simply a generic name of all of the forces, including some Australian forces uh, and some uh, planes that 
had flown off carriers which we had lost that had gone down, but the planes flew in and joined our forces, uh, Army uh, P-40s and P-39s, which weren't much good for high altitude stuff, but they helped support our ground forces in infantry who were still beating off the Japanese uh, attacks. And this, this went on for uh, periodically, long about uh, two weeks later, I think it was maybe August 21st or 22nd, uh, Colonel Ijiki, uh, who was quite a hero of the Japanese and had done an outstanding job in China where he had won all of his medals and so on, he only had half his force, about 900 to 1,000, and he decided to attack across the Tenaru River, which was just a little south of uh, where the airfield was, which was very close to where we had come in two weeks earlier. Uh, I had run an artillery survey, and we knew and had registered on the mouth of the Tenaru River there, so we immediately opened fire on them, and uh, I guess according to our infantry that we did a fabulous job. They penetrated our lines in a couple of places. Ijiki had said, oh, those Marines, they're young, they have inexperience, they won't give us any trouble. Uh, but we did give them some trouble. As I say, they got into our lines a couple of times, but we drove them out fairly quickly. And then again, there was a, a, a lull attempt until about September. By now, the Japanese were getting to the point where they were far more serious about the fact that we were serious about uh, continuing to hold the, hold the place, which we were, of course. Uh, and again, the whole big idea was to keep Australia from getting invaded. Later on, I'll get ahead of myself a little bit here. Catherine and I went to uh, Australia in 1988, and we were down in Melbourne, and a lot of the people remembered that were old enough to remember uh, the fact, and they say, you saved our you-know-what. And uh, we were happy, and I can remember going around the corner, and we'd able to form a battalion uh, to be in their Anzac parade. And as we'd come around the corner, they'd say, aye oh, there, here come the bloody Yanks, you know. And so that was a lot of fun, and it was nice to be welcomed and appreciated and everything else that uh, went on. Uh, Okay, we, we stayed there, and uh, they made a big attempt to drive us off, and that's what the Edson, Colonel Edson and his battle of Bloody Ridge. And uh, we were kind of, still hadn't received any reinforcements, although the 7th Marine Regiment, which was our regiment, uh, finally was beginning to join us, and 164th Infantry Regiment. And the 164th arrived just the day that the, the Japanese were attacking Edson's uh, Raider Battalion on uh, Raider's Ridge, and we were able to infiltrate with Colonel uh, Hall's permission, the Army uh, Lieutenant Colonel, his troops right in with our troops, which then reinforced our lines, and uh, the Army was delighted. And from then on, and they, 164th, started to call themselves the 164th Marines. They were a National Guard outfit and well-liked uh, oh, I would say four, five, six years older than most of our Marines, and we enjoyed having them. Mm -hmm. uh, then again, a lull until about uh, November, and some of the pictures that, that you have, uh, my outfit by this time had crossed the Matanikau River, and because we'd made an attack against them, again to defend our perimeter, uh, holding the airfield. And this particular time, uh, we heard that the Japanese were with a huge task force and 11 troop transports was on its way down from Rabaul and uh, truck. Now, by this time also, air reinforcements had come in and our Cactus uh, uh, Air Force uh, was much stronger, although the Japanese were still attacking almost every day with bombers and so on. But we could get aloft up high enough and out of the clouds and so on. Now the Japanese Zero, which was the fighter plane, was superior to our fighter planes uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis. But when we coordinated our attacks and stayed up in the clouds and had the sun behind us and so on, and so we shot them down, about three of theirs down for every one that we lost. Fortunately, being fairly close to the island that we'd just flown from, uh, almost all of the pilots we were able to rescue, although we did, we did lose a, a, a fairly fairly large uh, number. I got a command at that particular time on my battery 
across the Matanico. The only time in my artillery history that I ever received the command, fire at will, which means fire until we tell you to stop. That's the only time I ever, ever had it. Well, what they were doing was telling me to get rid of, indirectly telling me to get rid of the ammunition that I had, and uh, then they were going to pull me out. Of course, they didn't tell me all this at the mm -hmm. time. So we fired until the tubes became hot. You could spit on them and on the tube, and it would sizzle. It was actually that hot. And they pulled us out. Well, on the way down, we sunk, let's see, it was uh, seven of their 11 uh, troop transports, and the, the four remaining, seeing what had happened to their fellow seven, beached them up uh, north of us a little bit. And uh, so we were able to damage them severely and so on. That was about the last major effort uh, that, that they were able to, able to make. Uh, we stayed on, well, let me tell you a quick story there mm -hmm. about the Cactus Air Force. Uh, General Geiger came in with his uh, major uh, cram, I think his name was, was his pilot. And General Geiger commanded the Cactus Air Force, which was everything that was there, whether it be Australian Army, Navy, or Marine. And uh, they landed, and he took over the uh, all of the air, air people that were there. And uh, Cram went up to him and said, General, he said, can I borrow our plane? What for? He said, uh, well, he said, I've been talking to the Seabees, and those beached uh, four uh, transports up there uh, are there, and they still got people that are unloading. And the Seabees uh, have worked it out. Seabees would be construction mm -hmm. battalions, Navy, have worked it out so we can put a a torpedo underneath each each wing, and uh, then run a rope into the into the cabin, and we can go up there and we can drop the torpedoes on them. And I, I think the general's comment, the hell you say, yeah. <laughs> and Cram said, yes, but we think it'll work. And so they took off and they uh, went up there and darned if they didn't put one of the torpedoes and one of the uh, transports up there and blew that side of it to smithereens. And then instead of coming home, <laughs> He turns around and comes back and puts the other torpedo on the other side of the of the transport. Well, by this time, we're listening to the radio transmissions uh, back on, on Guadalcanal itself. We we're probably maybe five, ten miles away. And uh, I'm telling my troops now, they're coming back in. And for God's sake, don't shoot down our, our big, uh, the general's uh, <laughs> private <laughs> private airplane. And so they, the troops said, nodded their head and said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, sure enough, here they come. Well, the big old PBY, blum, 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 <laughs> blum, comes in, and uh, it uh, starts to make its landing, and it's being pursued and shot at by a Japanese Zero. And right behind the Japanese Zero is one of our Grummans, and it's shooting at the Zero. And behind the, the Grumman is another Zero shooting at that, that one. And so my troops are, obey my uh, wishes and don't shoot down uh, the big transport plane. Then they shoot down the Zero, and then they shoot down our Grumman. And the Grumman pilot later said, I wondered how I was going to land. I was damaged. <laughs> he said, but you, you guys took, took care of that. Yeah. So we th went on then, uh, continued to defend, and they continued to bomb us. But they never made any big, major attack on us again mm -hmm. on Guadalcanal. And I think it's General Patch from the Army uh, came in. I think it was with his 25th Division in the Americal Division and relieved us in the early weeks of uh, December 1942. Uh, and then we boarded ship and uh, set sail for uh, Australia uh, for rest and recuperation. By this time, 80% of us had malaria. Uh, I had malaria twice. This, and uh, I went to the division hospital the second time, the second day that I got there. When my uh, sergeant, uh, first sergeant came to visit me, I said, get me out of here. This is a real drag. So they dragged me back and had to put a guard on my tent because uh, in my meanderings and so on and, and uh, uh, temperature and all the rest, I'd start wandering. And he said, I'm going to put a guard on there because he says, you wander at night and I don't want you to wander over to the Japanese lines, which they did. But eventually, I think uh, I was a, almost the last of the original Marines on the island to get off the island. As I say, by this time, 80% of us had malaria. Mm -hmm. And uh, the casualties there were not as great as we late, later suffered on Iwo Jima. Uh, I think we had 1,100 uh, killed and about double that number uh, wounded. 
which isn't too bad because we'd later been reinforced with some additional Marines. I think we landed in, we were going to land in Brisbane, but lo and behold, they discovered a tremendous swamp just outside of Brisbane, full of Anopheles mosquitoes mm -hmm. and, and so on. So uh, they decided they'd take us to, the, to Melbourne. All three infantry, our infantry divisions uh, camped in and around Melbourne, uh, close to better liberty facilities for the troops and so on. Mm -hmm. We went up to Ballarat ourselves and the engineers and I think an ordnance company and uh, my artillery regiment. Uh, as I say, by this time I'd made captain. Uh, we were getting promoted so fast, I was only a first lieutenant, I think, for six weeks. Uh, Catherine was writing me. I had married her in, in uh, late m March 1940-42, uh, and uh, she's writing captain, and I'm still writing her letters back, signed lieutenant. Yeah. But uh, we went up to Ballarat. Ballarat is the home of the only gold mine in Aus Australia. And we stayed there long enough, and darned if I don't get transferred to... to uh, Auckland, New Zealand, to command a 155-gun outfit, which is a much longer range artillery weapon, and I commanded it in a couple of maneuvers. And then back to Guadalcanal, of all places, back to Guadalcanal again, I participated briefly in the New Georgia campaign, got shot at a little bit, but nothing that really bothered me tremendously, uh, which... Uh, the bombings that we had on Guadalcanal. Afraid, uh, uh, well, not necessarily was I just terribly afraid to where I was afraid to move, because I kept on doing my job. Apprehensive, sure, uh, but I, like uh, most of the rest of us that survived, and didn't, I didn't get badly hit except a slight wound on Iwo Jima uh, later on. But it was kind of those things where you figure, well, if you're going to get it, you're going to get it. But until you actually do get it, when it doesn't smart or hurt or anything else, and, and, and so you go on uh, uh, doing the particular job that you're assigned to do. Finally, they realized that they were going to need a lot of us to come back to the United States because the Marine Corps was going to build up to six divisions. Now, a Marine division at that time was, oh, probably 20 to 22,000 uh, people in an infantry division which would include an artillery regiment and a tank battalion, some pioneers, engineers, and so on. So we were sent back to, to form uh, one of the new divisions. And this, for me, was going to be the 5th Marine Division. And so in March, uh, they said, uh, go down to the airfield. And it was now we'd build a second airfield and uh, catch a transport plane back to the States, which I did. Of course, the plane came in and blew two tires on the way in and uh, had a faulty engine, so they had to repair it. But at any rate, I got back to the States, I think it was March uh, 1944. Uh, and you've got a picture of Catherine meeting me down on the Union Station with my overseas uh, hat on and uh, kissing and hugging and going through all of that uh, routine. And uh, we, we came up and had uh, dinner in the Union Building. As I say, University Hall had uh, been torn down by that, by that time. And then very shortly thereafter, uh, I, the 5th Marine Division got orders to go to uh, Hawaii, and there we did some more training. And by this time, I'd made major, but there were so many <laughs> brand new majors uh, that they didn't have room for me in the artillery. So they said, well, uh, you've had a lot of experience and so on. Would you like to go to the tank battalion? And I kind of said, well, what choice do I have? And they said, little or none. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, well, I'll go to the tank battalion. So I got up there and they said, well, we don't, shoot, don't know how we're going to use you. Can you fire the tank's indirect fire? And I said, well, a tank gun is a, is a direct fire weapon. But yes, I can try. So sure enough, I, I tried. And uh, much to the general's uh, delight, the general in, uh, in command of the uh, 5th Marine Division, we put on a show for him. But we never did use them indirect, indirect fire in combat. Uh, can you, along uh, can in, you explain uh, what that is? I don't understand what that means. Say again? Indirect fire. What does that mean? Well, indirect fire, if I'm going to fire at you, there's an intervening hill mass, and artillery can fire up and over and down on you. Mm -hmm. The tanks are just not geared for that. It's mm -hmm. a high-velocity, high-speed weapon, and it, direct fire is, is the way it works. Okay. After all, they're a mechanized uh, weapon, and they're going to fire at 
enemy tanks and mm -hmm. so on. Uh, we had done a considerable amount of naval gunfire. Uh, I'd say that uh, uh, Iwo Jima is about 450 in, uh, or from uh, J parts of Japan and maybe 700 miles from most of Japan. Mm -hmm. Uh, naval gunfire had been peppering them all, all the way since the fall of 1944, it would have been. And uh, then then uh, aerial bombardment also had taken place. Uh, let's see, it was uh, Kur Kurabashi was, the, I think, the uh, Japanese lieutenant general in, in command. He had about 20,000 uh, Japanese forces there. And they were there for over a year. And... Uh, they dug in unbelievably. They had miles and miles and miles of underground tunnels. Uh, Iwo Jima is five miles long, two and a half miles wide at the widest, and a thousand yards wide at the narrow spit to, just before you get to Mount Suribachi, which is the commanding uh, terrain and highest uh, ground about oh, 360 feet above uh, ground in the southern part. Mm -hmm. And so that's where we're going to land, uh, particularly our division, which was the 5th. And uh, I went ashore with the infantry, the 5th wave of the infantry, which would be about 45 minutes behind the 1st uh, uh, wave. Uh, when I got ashore, I had a heck of a time going through this uh, uh, sloppy, uh, volcanic, uh, dark, uh, almost black sand uh, from previous eruptions of the volcano years years before, uh, which I knew were going to be trouble for our tanks, but uh, our tank battalion commander had son, John, you go ashore with a radio jeep, and when you figure it's time for our tanks to come in, give us a call. So I said, okay, I'd, I'd do it. I didn't have much choice after he said what he wanted, yeah. So I landed, and uh, as I say, I saw far more uh, dead Marines than I saw dead Japanese. And really, as I look back on it, I do not think well-dug-in troops are going to be that badly damaged. I don't care how good the naval gunfire is. I don't care how good the bombing is if you were really dug in, because I'd been dug in right in the uh, near the airstrip on Guadalcanal. And in fact, they, they dropped 20, uh, something like 25 to 40 different 500-pound uh, bombs, and, and uh, we got shelled, shelled by two uh, battleships one night on Guadalcanal, and within a 25-yard radius, I had something like 20 odd holes, either 14-inch shell holes or 500-pound bomb holes. And I got picked up and slapped down in my foxhole, but I didn't lose a man. Yes, we did lose some Marines that night, but, you know, not, not really not that many. Mm -hmm. So I think the same thing was true on Iwo Jima, that uh, they didn't, uh, we didn't do that much damage to them. He had told his troops, I do not want you to make any of those banzai attacks, which mean a banzai attacks, the officers draw out their swords and, and lead their, their, their troops uh, to attack our, our forces. And they had been successful uh, uh, on, on some occasions on doing this. But he says, no, he says, the, the Americans have too much firepower. And only one dumb regimental commander, Japanese, was dumb enough to try it. And we slaughtered them when they, mm -hmm. when they did. But other than that, it was a, a, a nip and tuck outfit, uh, or a fray, I should say. Some days we were lucky enough if we made uh, uh, 300 yards in the attack. Uh, other days, maybe if we made 50, and some days we couldn't make any uh, advance. The ground got uh, more uh, uh, troublesome as we went further north, and there was a lot, lot more rocks and, and hills and, and so on, not as high as uh, Mount Suribachi, but nevertheless high. Mm -hmm. And uh, the technique there finally that we developed with the infantry is that they would discover, well, they would get stopped. In other words, they'd get shot at and uh, take some casualties, and then they'd call for us, and we'd come up with our tanks and our, our fighting tanks, which would fire a high-explosive shell, and we'd fire at shrubbery, anything that looked like it conceal a place where they were or where the infantry pointed out they'd receive some fire. And so we did this, and then uh, we would back out the fighting tanks and run in the flamethrowing tanks. Now, the Marine Corps doesn't have any flamethrowing tanks anymore. They were con considered uh, 
uh, a really an abusive type of weapon and cruel and, and so on. And I guess really they probably were. And so I think it was 1983, talking to some of my uh, remaining uh, uh, tank battalion friends, they uh, kind of outlawed it. And the last uh, flamethrowing tanks we had was in about 1983. Hmm. And uh, uh, they were good. It, they, they, it, the the uh, flame napalm would squirt right out through the tube, which, which had another tube inside of it squirting out the napalm. And they could fire about 100 yards, and they can fire for three minutes. Mm. And uh, this we would blast everything that looked like it was a potential hole or cave or whatever it was. <clears throat> and it was uh, effective. And bottled up uh, some that were inside and burned up some others that were inside. Mm. Then we would back the flamethrower tanks out and run in the fighting tanks and uh, shoot up whatever we could see with the infantry. And finally, we would take the ground, as I say sometimes, we only made 50 yards. Uh, other times we made three or 400. That was really great. This kept going on. Uh, the casualties that we took were unbelievable. Unbelievable. It was the only battle that the United States, including the Army and so on, that, uh, that we were in during the entire World War II, uh, where our casualties exceeded those of the enemy. Mm. Uh, uh, Kuribashi lost, I think, yeah, of his 20,000, he did lose. Of course, his were killed, all but about two or 300 that we, that we captured, uh, wounded and otherwise. But we lost 28,000 casualties in that same battle. I can remember we buried 8,000 of our Marines right there, mm. and more died out on the hospital ships that we were able to evacu evacuate them uh, to. Uh, Along about the March, we were up in the far corner, and that was all that was left from the Japanese physician. Turned out it was the headquarters of Kuribashi. Kuribashi committed suicide, or, or uh, Harry Kerry uh, himself, and then they made a last counterattack and, and killed some of our army that had begun to come in uh, to relieve us as we were unloading to get out mm. of, the, of the place. Uh, so we threw our uh, extra equipment that we'd put on the top of a couple of our tanks and uh, th threw it off to the side and, and finally wiped out the last of that 200 that had, that had charged us. The colonel and I are on board an LSD, which is a landing ship dock, and that will take in the rear end. They bring in LCMs and L, uh, L, yeah, LCSs and so on into the rear of this LSD, which is full of water, Unload them, pump the water up a little bit more, pull the, the smaller ship back out and go get a, some more tanks. We had to leave about, I'd say, maybe 10 of our tanks badly damaged right there on the island and started unloading. We're back up on the bridge and I'm with the colonel up there. And he says, my God, what is that? And I said, that's a Japanese light tank. He said, what are we going to do with it? I said, the men want to get it fixed when we get back to Hawaii and see if they can make it run. He said, you're kidding me. I said, no, sir, I'm not. So that was all right. He just grunted and so on. <laughs> so then later on, here comes something else. And he says, oh, my goodness, what's that? I said, sir, that's, that's a Japanese motorcycle. And I said, that's for you. <laughs> and he says, does it run? And I said, no, not now, but, the, but our men think that they can fix it too. So lo and behold, we got, uh, got back to uh, Hawaii and no one, uh, well, I was delighted because there was a message from Catherine saying Kathleen, our first child, had been born on April 4th, uh, 1945. And uh, very quickly we had the Japanese uh, light tank running and uh, uh, the troops were running it back and forth. And the colonel had his motorcycle and he was delighted because <laughs> he had his own transportation around the place and so on. Now that's an overall description of my combat uh, experiences. Yes, there were some other things that were e exciting and so on. Now, I've taken up all the time and, and probably uh, I've answered some of your questions, but maybe not all of them. Well, would you like to talk about your original training when you were at Quantico? Yes. I, um, and how was it, because you said you had been disenchanted with the military, but yet you ended up going to officer training and and continued in the military? Well, 
I didn't feel at the time that I got back out of the ROTC, I didn't feel that I, that I enjoyed it. I wasn't enjoying it. Mm -hmm. Part of it was the fact that I had a real SOB uh, as my commanding officer mm -hmm. who was making it, I thought, as difficult as he, as he could make it. Mm -hmm. I wasn't a whiz-bang at mathematics and so on. Believe it or not, I was in artillery. And later on, I became a heck of a lot better at doing the same thing. But I just couldn't see the future in it mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I got out. And then, as I said, I, I was smart enough and a major in history, and I could see what was happening overseas. Mm -hmm. And I thought, this is really stupid now. Do you want to be an enlisted uh, man, or do you want to? Uh, and when my uncle and my mom heard about the candidates class, mm -hmm. that's when I, when I grabbed it. Uh, Quantico at that particular time, well, we still had the 03 rifle, for example. Now, what is that? What is that uh, well, it, it fires a 30 caliber bullet, and it was uh, it, it was an individual weapon uh, carried by by the infantry. Uh, we ha also had BARs, which was a far more automatic mm -hmm. weapon that, that that could fire rapid fire. But with the O3, it would you'd, you'd you'd take the cartridge and you'd push it down, and five sh uh, shells were, would go into the chamber. But then every time you fired one, you had to pull the bolt back and push it forward again. Mm -hmm. And later on, when the Army joined us on Guadalcanal, oh, we loved it when they said, look, if we have some casualties, you can have uh, the M1, which was a much better uh, mm -hmm. uh, rifle, now and why, it could fire just as accurately. Why would the Marines not have the same weaponry that the Army had? Well, in many cases, uh, Army ordnance and so on would develop it, and I think, uh, very rightfully, they would give it to the Army to try out first. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, the 164th, uh, which I talked about, called them 164th Marines, showed up. They had them, and, uh, but they were very gracious and would let us have some of them. Mm -hmm. And we tried them out and, and uh, so on. The infantry, the training that I had in, in uh, Quantico was all infantry-type training, all of it, mm -hmm. and how to employ your men and your squads and maneuver them and, uh, and so on, and how to march through uh, uh, rough terrain with a 50-pound pack on your back and so on. Shoot, I'm lucky. Well, just recently recovering from surgery, I'm told not to lift more than 10 pounds for <laughs> another four weeks here, yeah. Now, is that training that you had in Quantico, is that the basic training that yes. the enlisted man would have? Basic training, very um, much similar to the Paris recruit training at Paris Island okay. and San Diego, uh -huh. yes. Uh -huh. Very similar. And uh, our our, uh, our instructors were enlisted people uh -huh. that... Uh, Later on, uh, when we did get our commissions, uh, they would salute us, and the tradition was to give them a dollar each time you got a salute, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which was kind of nice. Yeah. Now, now you had that type of training, and then you went on for two other types of training? Is that I, correct? I, I went on, well, the, the uh, officer's uh, training, which was also at Quantico, the ROC, mm -hmm. uh, was even more the employment uh, oh, on up to a company level. So now at company level, we're talking about maybe 200 uh, troops and how to command a company in mm -hmm. combat, in infantry again. So what kinds of things would you learn then in that? Well, you would time? learn how to, how to tell your lieutenants what to do with their platoons and where to maneuver and where to go. And you guys take this hill over here and you guys go down mm -hmm. this ravine there and I'll see you at the other side over there and, and so on. And then we played those roles mm -hmm. uh, as, as inf infantry people. Mm -hmm. uh, then the artillery training, as I said, which was the third group that took us up to Pearl Harbor time, uh, was actually firing an artillery battery, indirect fire at targets at some distance, distance away. Mm -hmm. So I was pretty well trained to do s several different things, everything except tank battalion training, which <laughs> took place several years, several mm -hmm. years later, yeah. So did you feel then when you were sent to Guadalcanal that you were adequately training, trained for what you were doing? I felt that I was adequately trained. Uh, combat experience, no, I hadn't had any. Right, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But as I said, I hadn't been shot at. But when I mm -hmm. was finally shot at, it, it wasn't absolutely a terrible thing. I was apprehensive, but I was never scared to death. Mm -hmm. uh, were there some that were? Yeah, sure. Now... You were then a, a lieutenant when you were on Guadalcanal, and you were promoted? I was a lieutenant until I found out about the second week there getting letters 
from Catherine addressed to Captain mm -hmm. Frothingham that yes, I so, was a second lieutenant for six weeks, I think. So did your role change then when you were on Guadalcanal with the increase in your I range? was the survey officer for our particular battalion, running the survey to coordinate the fire, to mass, by that I mean so that all four guns would hit the same target. You had to run a, a mathematical survey in order to do that. And I was the survey officer for the battalion, and that was my job as a first lieutenant. Mm -hmm. Very quickly, when I made captain, they made me executive officer of one of the firing batteries, meaning I was in charge of the four guns, or howitzers, I should say. Mm -hmm. uh, then I did that for three or four months, and then I became commanding officer of that same battery. And I was commanding officer of the battery when we left in... Uh, about the 5th of, uh, just after Eleanor Roosevelt, just before Eleanor Roosevelt called to make her visit to the uh, division on Guadalcanal. Five yep. days ahead of then, we left the island. Oh my goodness, Eleanor Roosevelt visited Guadalcanal? Say again, please. El Eleanor Roosevelt visited Guadalcanal during yes, the fighting? Yes, she did. She did. What? She's a gutsy lady. I'll say. Gutsy lady. That yeah. is quite amazing. Well, she did so many things for Franklin uh, uh, D., uh, because of his handicap mm -hmm. with his paralysis and so on. Mm -hmm. yeah. What did the troops think of that, of her being there? What did I think of it? Well, what did the troops under your the, command think The troops that? loved it. Mm -hmm. The troops loved it, yeah. <clears throat> now, Guadalcanal was still not secured when she landed there. Mm -hmm. uh, the Army and uh, one of our newer divisions, our Marine Corps divisions, uh, actually kept on pushing. And I think we finally pushed the Japanese off the island in about February 43. No. Yes, February 43. Can I go back to your howitzers? Can you talk about what they are and how would they be placed? Because you said you were in charge of four of them. Yeah. So would they be placed like a mile apart or 50 feet no. apart or... How, how does that work? At that, at that particular time, we don't have any anymore. There was 75 pack howitzer. And they could be disassembled and they could be carried individually by men. Uh, sometimes part of the parts after you disassemble it were heavy enough, it was better to have two men carry them. <clears throat> uh, you could pull them with a jeep. They weren't, they, they weren't that big. Uh, a 75, uh, maybe three inch uh, 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 diameter of the tube uh, would, would be the, the, the size of it. Uh, then you'd take your four guns and you'd space them maybe, oh, 15, maybe 20 uh, yards apart or maybe even closer than this. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then you'd line them up and then you'd get out there with your aiming circle and mathematically by swinging off angles, you would get them all so that their tubes were parallel so that when you then fired the battery as a whole, all four shells hopefully would land on the same target. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And would they be fired at simultaneously, or would it be like one, two, well, three, four? If I, if I was able to fire the battery all together, uh, I would ask them to report to me when they were ready. And when I, then they'd report, number one ready, sir, two ready, four ready, three ready. And then I would say, battery ready to fire. And then the fire direction center would tell me when to shoot. And when they'd say, fire when ready, then I'd give the command, fire. Well, also I had told them maybe fire five rounds, okay. Well, the first round would probably all go up pretty near together. But then on, they would fire when they were ready to fire, you know, when the realign after every fire, because it would jerk the, the, oh. the, the gun a little bit out of its out of the line that it had, so they'd have to mm -hmm. come back looking through their sight to the aiming stake, and then they'd get back on and they'd fire until they'd expended the five rounds. And then I'd report back to the fire direction center, rounds completed. Mm -hmm. And except for that one time when I had fire at will. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the forward observers would take a look at where the shells were landing, and if they were okay, they might get two or three other battalions to aim in on the same same target mm -hmm. until uh, whatever, whatever the job needed to be done had been accomplished. Now, so how many men are involved in a battery? A battery. Just I had part. probably somewhere uh, when I was out there by myself, somewhere between forty-five and fifty. 
out there. And would all of those men be involved at once in in no, there were many other things that they had to do. There would be communication people, there would mm -hmm. be survey people, there would be my cooks and uh, uh, however else was needed. Mm -hmm. Now you should also remember that the Marine Corps does not have any medical personnel. The Navy furnishes us what we refer to as corpsmen, oh. and the corpsmen go along with us. And each battalion, like my battalion, we had a doctor, mm -hmm. uh, Navy. And let's uh, see, the Navy furnishes uh, the chaplain, and of course the Navy furnishes a lot of the supplies that we need, too. Or they get the supplies mm -hmm. and bring them to us, yeah. So when you are in the process of firing these howitzers, then how many men would be required to fire each one of those? They could probably do it with two, maybe three, but the usual complement in order to keep the ammunition coming up to the gun would be probably five or six. Mm -hmm. And then could. how long does it take once the howitzer is fired then to, for it to be ready to fire, fire again? again? Maybe they could fire three, maybe four, once in a while if they were really good, they could fire five rounds in a minute. Mm -hmm. But as I said earlier on that time of fire at will, the tubes do start to get hot. Okay. Yeah. So there's a fire center that gives you the order to fire? The forward observer calls mm -hmm. for the fire and gives us the approximate direction. Now he will fire and observe the rounds from one gun until he gets that gun's shells falling close to or on the target that he has picked. Mm -hmm. Once he has that, then he tells them, Okay, right on. Then you can bring <clears throat> all four guns or the 12 guns from your battalion or guns from your battalion and other battalions as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then surrounding you, would there be other battalions yes, that are doing the yes. same thing? <clears throat> on, Guadal <clears throat> on Guadalcanal, let's see, we had one, two, three, four battalions. Four battalions. I said they never did land our 155 howitzers, but we had a 105 howitzer group, which was a little heavier than our 75 mm -hmm. with us at the time, yes. And were, were those weapons very effective? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. But uh, along about October or November on Guadalcanal, for example, the uh, Japanese had two, if not four, guns that could out outrange what we had. Oh. So they could fire at us at will and we could not answer the fire. Mm because the Navy had shoved off with our exactly. 155 howitzers, mm -hmm. right. Then, so Guadalcanal then, once it was taken, and it, did it remain then in American hands or did you? Yes, it, beca it became a forward supply depot. Mm -hmm. And so as we went on up uh, to the Marshalls and Tarawa and Saipan, and let's see, Guam and Tinian, and took them, um, and m many of the supplies and food and so on would come that had been shipped from the States to Guadalcanal and Guadalcanal forward to these other places that we had taken. Mm -hmm. Yes. How did, how did the terrain of Guadalcanal compare to that of Iwo Jima? Totally different. Guadalcanal was almost strictly jungle. Most of the fighting that we did defending that airfield was in a coconut uh, grove uh, that was uh, palm trees and so on, right along the coast. Mm -hmm. And it was fairly flat and some uh, kind of grassy areas and, and uh, very suitable for uh, digging in and artillery placement and so on. Uh, Guadalcanal, uh, except for a couple of uh, level places where the Japanese had already uh, built Airfield 1 and had uh, almost finished airfield number two, was flat, o f relatively flat only in those places. But once you got a little further north, it was mm -hmm. very rugged, nasty terrain. Mm -hmm. Nasty as far as attacking the enemy is concerned. The enemy had so many places to dig in and hide behind rocks and boulders and, and uh, dug in caves and so on. Mm -hmm. How am I doing? You're doing great. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Tell All me, right. tell me when you're ready to uh, take a break or All to right. stop. Any time that you're ready. Okay. Um, 
<clears throat> I understand that you saw the raising of the American flag on Mount Sorbachi. Mm. Anyone that said that they saw the raising <clears throat> of the American flag on Iwo Jima, and there were two flags, I'll tell you about them in a minute. I don't say that they're liars, but I say that they saw the flag, but I doubt seriously if they saw the actual raising. The actual raising took place in a matter of seconds. Mm -hmm. Let's see, General, uh, Colonel Chambers, who commanded one of the battalions of the, three, of the uh, 28th Marine Regiment that assaulted Mount Suribachi, brought a small American flag with him in his pack. And that's the one that they took up there, and that first one went up Oh, about uh, maybe mid-morning, maybe late mid-morning. And uh, boy, when the, all the ships and the whole fleet out there and so on saw it, and so on, they started to toot their horns, and we looked around. I was, of course, had been ashore for five days then, and sure enough, there was a little tiny flag uh, flying. And I must admit it was emotional as far as I was concerned. Uh, kind of tears came to my eyes and so on. Now, my Marines, on the other hand, uh, their comments as they turned around was, oh, ye gods, there's our GD flag flying and so on. Uh, they're not known for being the most articulate in the world about expressing themselves. Uh, colorful, but uh, not articulate. So Chambers, when he saw this and heard all of the horn tooting from the ships, said, that's not big enough. So he sent a sergeant down to the beach to get a bigger flag. Sergeant gets down there to an LST. LST is a landing ship dock, lands, lands heavy trucks, and can land tanks as well. So he goes up to this one, the sergeant does, and the skipper is positively delighted. He says, uh, you mean if we give you one of our large flags, you'll fly it from the top of the mountain? Yeah, we'll replace the little one that's up there. You're kidding me. Oh, I'd be delighted, he said. So he gave, us, gave the sergeant one. Rosenthal, who took the famous picture, is there, right there on the beach. And he heard what's going on. And he says, Sergeant, what are you going to do? He says, I'm going to take this larger flag up to the top of the mountain. We're going to fly it up there. And Rosenthal says, can I go along with you? And the, and the sergeant says, sure, but you're going to get shot at. Rosenthal said, I'll take my chances. Well, I forget the type of camera that he had, but at any rate, it had about 36 different shots in it. And the one that became famous was simply one of many that he took at the time. But he caught it just right. The flag is going up. All of them, five men are straining to, to raise it even further. They'd found a big, long metal pole somehow, and they rigged it to, to, to hold the flag, and they got it up. And again, lots more cheering and more tooting of horns and so on. And again, I turned around, and I saw it up. But I still contend... The person who says that they saw it going up is probably not right. Mm -hmm. They saw it up, but not going up. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes, I was, I was there. Were, do you feel that you were well supplied when you were on Iwo Jima? Well what? Supplied in terms of your... Oh, yes, the supplies were, mm -hmm. were, were good by that, that point. <clears throat> Rather interestingly, Iwo Jima is, it was, is still a semi-active volcano, and, so, and some of it's working underneath. And the infantry were able to put down their canned rations, dig a hole and put it down in there and heat it. Hmm. And, and then eat heated rations uh, out of the can. Is that true all around the island? Or was it just in a few places? Uh, some of the other islands that we occupied were volcanic in nature, but that one was an active, uh, well, I can't say that it was an active volcano, but it was still smoldering underneath because that's where the heat was coming hmm. from, right. Now, you were an officer during the entire war, so that makes you maybe have a different view of the war than, than the enlisted man, do you think? A good, good, good point, Harriet. I hear stories about people who don't want to talk about their combat experiences. And when I am asked, why are you so free of talking about your experiences, I was not in the front-line infantry. I was not in direct, immediate contact with the enemy, swinging my sword or whipping out my pistol and so on. I only personally killed one enemy during the entire war, and it was really unfair because uh, I saw where this one was up directing. He was a forward observer 
directing mortar fire on our troops, and I saw him because he was up on the top of the hill, and, and, and when he would drop down behind his cover, I could see the light shining through from behind him. Mm. And then when he'd come back up, the light would disappear. So I knew what was going mm. on. Well, there was a 75-millimeter half-track right sitting right there, and they were receiving some of this fire. So I said, I know who's shooting at you. They said, Major, you do? Yeah. And I said, he's right up on the top of the hill. Can you bring us on him? I said, yeah. So I climbed up on the back and bore sighted, meaning they opened up the breach and I looked through the bore mm. until I brought him down close. And then I said, okay, now fire one. They fired one. And I said, that's short. Bring it up two mils. Run it up two mils. Fire another one. That one went over. Then I said, all right, bring it down one mil and don't shoot until I tell you. Okay. When the little light at the top disappeared, I knew he was up in his in his hole again. And I said, now fire. Bluey. Up, up he went. His rifle went one area. His hel helmet went another area and so on. But as I say, that's the only one that I ever personally uh, uh, killed myself. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was kind of an unfair thing. Me with a 75 gun and him with nothing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. I'm sure I was responsible indirectly for killing a lot of them uh, with my artillery and later with my tanks. But uh, I was not directly responsible for pulling the trigger, shall we say, yeah. How were, were you in communication with the people above you who were even higher rank, and how would they let you know what the overall strategy was and keep you The abreast? overall strategy that I'm quoting to you in some of the battles I'm talking about, I have researched it a great deal myself. Mm -hmm. That's why, if I'm sounding knowledgeable, I'm far more knowledgeable than had I just stuck to minding my own uh, business, mm -hmm. uh, but I enjoy talking. I enjoy uh, giving speeches. And so, so you're saying that during battle, that you really perhaps didn't have an heard a lot of rumors and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, I would know, of course, if we'd advanced, and uh, within a day or two after I was given that one command, fire at will, and then they pulled me out of there. Then I found out within a day or two why they'd pulled us out, because they were afraid the Japanese were going to mount a big attack and wipe me out if, mm -hmm. I, if they hadn't pulled me out, yeah. But, but you wouldn't know, say, from mm -hmm. minute to minute. And were, were you in radio contact? Yes, or? radio and mm -hmm. telephone, yeah. What's the difference between radio and telephone in terms of Well, telephone is a, is a landline. You actually have to lay the lines. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, if you go over it with a tracked vehicle or a tank, you're going to chew up and break the line. Occasionally it would get caught in the wheels of a, even a Jeep and, and pull it apart. Mm -hmm. And uh, the radios would work, but they wouldn't always work. But if you had land communication, it would work and work quite well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really, really well. Now, the men who were under your command, were they from all over the United States? Let me think a minute. Yes, they were. Very few, very few Marines from uh, Illinois. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think only, I only know of one other senior officer from Illinois, uh, and he's gone, yeah. Mm -hmm. As are most of the people that I served with, yeah. As far as communication from back home, for example, your wife or your, your parents, um, was that something, a constant stream, or did that get interrupted, or... or well, they had they had V mail, and I'm not exactly sure how that worked, but it was a thing that the that the that w a form that you filled out, and you had to make it fairly brief, and it was uh, far more rapid. Now, how it was actually transmitted to us overseas, I don't know, but I know I did get a lot of letters from uh, Catherine, and I wrote a lot of letters, mm -hmm. and, and yes, it would be spaced in between it. I think maybe there would be as long as two or three weeks before she'd get a letter from me. Mm -hmm. Not that I wasn't writing, because I was trying. When I could, I'd try and write every day. Mm 